Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Ministry in the Spirit. And in these programs we've seen that Jesus Christ is the model minister. He is the servant of the Lord, which means that when Jesus came to this earth, he lived for the will of God. He surrendered to the will of God. And that meant he was called to serve others. Everything about Jesus' ministry was about serving God and others. And therefore, he's left for us this model to follow. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called not just to be like Jesus in our morality, but also to be servants like Jesus, to be like him in our ministry. And at this point in the teaching, we're looking at Jesus' healing ministry and how that operates today. God is a healing God. He says, I am the Lord that heals you. And we've seen so many examples in our own ministry of Jesus healing the sick today. And it's not a complicated issue, really. It's just a matter of an answer to prayer because God answers prayer. If he's a healing God, he will answer prayers for healing. Now, we know that not everybody gets healed and certainly not immediately. And there is a mystery at work in this. But we know that when Jesus came, he ministered healing. He ministered perfectly the Father's will. So many of the gospel stories are taken up with the mighty works of Jesus as the healer in touching people's lives and healing people of all different kinds of diseases. Now, the Bible says that Jesus Christ has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. And he sent his early disciples out on missions of preaching. And as they were preaching, he told them also to heal the sick. The Bible describes that the disciples went out everywhere preaching the word and signs and wonders accompanied the preaching of the word of God. And so the healing ministry is very relevant for our lives today. And it is also deeply rooted in the biblical testimony, both Old Testament and New Testament. We see examples of people being healed in Old Testament times, almost right from the very beginning because God is always concerned about the needs of people. Sickness that has come into this world as a result of the fall, as a result of sin, that's how sickness came in. And we know that many people struggle with pain and with sicknesses in their body. But the Bible examples show us that God is a healing God. And so in this session, I'm going to start to look at some of the Old Testament examples of God and his healing. Healing did not just begin to happen when Christ came because God has always been a healing God. But when Jesus was sent into this world, he became a wonderful expression of God's healing power. Jesus is today still the healer of broken bodies and the healer of broken hearts. So as we watch and listen today, I pray that God will give you insight into the healing power of God and that God will give you encouragement to pray to him in the name of Jesus and to find healing for your body and healing for your heart. We know that not all healing is physical, that there's a lot of need in our hearts for emotional healing. But whether it's a physical need or emotional need, God is able to heal you today. So God bless you as you watch and listen to this teaching in today's session. Something else I want you to notice, there several months must have passed before there was some convincing proof that a healing had taken place. The miracle may have been instant, but there had been several months before there was any evidence of that healing. Now this goes to show us that 
uh, that not all healings will immediately demonstrate evidence. And there's a, a faith element here that we cannot ignore. But of course, uh, this must have been, uh, uh, faith must have played a part in all of this as Abraham is used by God. Okay, let's go to the next uh, example. Numbers chapter 12, and the full text here is uh, verses 1 to 16. Here we have the story of Miriam's healing from leprosy. Now, uh, if you uh, remember the story, the text is there before you. Miriam and Aram spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Be very careful before you start grumbling against those who are set in leadership and anointed leaders amongst the body of Christ. Be very careful. And this murmuring was heard by the Lord, and it says now, verse 3, the man, Moses, was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, now hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed uh, them above the tabernacle, departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow, and Aaron turned to Miriam, and there she was, a leper. Now, of course, Moses interceded for Miriam to be healed, and God said, yes, but send her out of the camp for seven days, that's the condition for her healing. Now, Miriam's healing from leprosy demonstrates some of the points that I was making from the earlier passage. Moses is a prophet. He ministers the healing. He does it by intercession. Moses' sickness was sent by God as a punishment. Let me again stress this. When I say it's sent by God, I am not saying this sickness came from God. God, his nature is, a, is to heal. Sickness doesn't come from a good God. Hello. You must understand that. Uh, in Acts 10.38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about healing all those who were oppressed by God. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? Is God the oppressor? No. Healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. The devil is the oppressor, God is the healer. The devil is the troublemaker, God is the good God. Okay? There, nothing evil resides in his nature. Sickness doesn't come from God. Sickness comes from the devil. Okay? But God will allow it, if necessary, as we see here, very clearly, he did. Now, uh, we also notice that the healing of Miriam pointed to her forgiveness. So the healing was a sign that God had forgiven her, isn't it? And also we need to notice again that the healing was not instantly revealed to everybody. There was a condition that she had to fulfill. An action. An action that she had to fulfill. And that's very important even in Jesus' ministry we see at times him expecting action from the people that he's healing. Okay, let's go to the next one. 1 Kings 13, and the full passage, verses 1 to 24. And uh, here is a rather unusual story about a prophet, a man of God, who went to Bethel, 
where Jeroboam had erected what was equivalent to a pagan shrine. He had, elect, he had uh, built two shrines and, and, and set up two calves, golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And this was a, an idolatrous situation. And this prophet went from Judah up to, to Israel up, and went to Bethel and prophesied against the altar. And, and uh, Jeroboam was there. Verse 2, it says, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who shall who burn incense on you, and the men's bones shall be burned on you. And this is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass when Jeroboam heard of the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel that he stretched out his hand uh, from the altar saying, Arrest him! Then his hand which he stretched out towards him withered so he could not pull it back. Then the altar also was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign spoken which the man of God had uh, given. And then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand be restored. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him. And then the story goes on. The king asks him to have food and he says, No, God, so you don't eat or drink. You just do the job. Then you get out of there. And then an old prophet met him on the way and said, No, 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 the Lord's spoken to me. Come and stay with me and eat. And you know what happened. A lion met that young prophet on the way and killed him because he had disobeyed the word of the Lord. And so this uh, shows us uh, that uh, some of the principles here, that fasting, there can be a place for fasting in healing because he was told to fast. That's why he wasn't allowed to eat or drink. Uh, That God's servants must obey the word of the Lord unconditionally. The death of the prophet don't want to alarm you but it does show us the seriousness that God expects us to take his word, the seriousness with which he expects us to take his word. We must never think we can treat the Spirit's promptings lightly. Okay, the next passage, 1 Kings 17. The full passage, verses 8 to 24. Here we have the son of the widow woman. Do you remember in 1 Kings 17 where the widow from Zarephath is supernaturally commanded to feed the prophet and uh, she was just going to have one last meal for her and her boy then they were going to die. Well, the Lord intervened through the prophet and something miraculous was provided for that family. But there came a day when the boy died and uh, she blamed Elijah. She said, you know, if you come to judge us, what this is terrible. And uh, then the prophet took the boy's body, carried it to his bed, and then he cried out to the Lord in intercession. Now just think about this. There is no record of any resurrection taking place before this time. No record at all. <laughs> and so the woman... The way she went for Elijah showed that she had faith that something that had never happened before was going to happen. Don't be limited in your thinking, in your ministry. This may, you may never have been used in this way before, but there's always a first time. You may have no precedent for what's about to happen, but it's going to happen. In some of the miracles that we are seeing these teeth miracles. And uh, there's been a lot of precedent in these miracles and in, in different places, revival places in, in the Philippines, in Argentina, and now it's uh, in Brazil and, and many places like that. Now it's touching many other nations as well. But uh, there was a time when I think people had never heard of this before. And uh, just because we haven't heard of it before it doesn't mean to say God isn't going to do it. Okay. It didn't stop Elijah praying. Now, then we also learn again how the, uh, pl- the place of intercession in healing. 
And uh, he's, in verse 21, he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. There's a physical action involved. We don't know why he did that. It's just something that he felt, presumably, he needed to do. We would say he was being led by the Holy Spirit. There's no technique about, hate, about raising somebody from the dead. You better listen to the voice of the Spirit. And then he interceded. And the sense here is it's strong intercession. And the, 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 the feeling you get is this, again, is he had to pray for some time. He had to pray repeatedly. And then it says, The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room into the house, and gave him to his mother, and said to her, See, your son lives. Verse 24, a very important verse, mark it down. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Here we have the basis of the signs and wonders ministry. That signs and wonders and miracles are there to confirm the word of the Lord. And that when we preach the gospel, God will confirm his word with signs and wonders following. Can you see this is part of the prophetic process? It's part of the prophetic ministry? Okay, now 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 8 to 37. There is the full passage. And we know that uh, Elisha has inherited a double portion of, of Elijah's spirit. And we see their ministry is very, very similar. And in 2 Kings 4, verses 8 to 37, we have two episodes. Two episodes of healing. Here we have a woman who is very hospitable. And uh, she looks after Elisha. And Elisha suggests that he can speak to the king on her behalf. He can do her a favor. And she says, I'm not interested in that. I'm not, I don't want any material reward. But Elisha discovers that the lady's barren and they want a child. And so a miracle takes place. Elijah announces, Elisha announces that, a, that she's going to have a child in 12 months' time. Now, there would have been a delayed appreciation of this. Woman would have had no evidence of any conception taking place until a few months had, had transpired and, and then, of course, no evidence that there was a son to be born until the child arrived. And so we have to grasp that at times there's a, there's a, there's a delay in, in, the, in the process of a miracle. There has to be a working of this miracle. And we have to grasp that and to think that everything has to be instantaneous and com complete and fully formed is, is ridiculous. These are, this is a fantasy world. The more I move in the miraculous, the more I realize this point. There are no fantasies with God. A fantasy miracle would be something along the lines of, of, the, of, the, of the prophet saying, well, here you are, you're going to have a baby, and out it pops. You know. God worked through the natural processes. As miraculous as this was, it was still something that worked in some way. And we have to grasp the working of a miracle. Okay, now, the woman gave birth to a boy, and later that boy died. But her faith in Elisha and his prophetic mantle remained absolute. He'd obtained the son for her, and surely he could restore her. So Elisha now does something strange. He gives Gehazi, his servant, his staff, and uh, sends him to restore the son's life. And the staff, again, here is the symbol of, of, uh, of Elisha's prophetic authority. And uh, Elisha, uh, Gehazi uh, uh, was, 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 stretches this staff over the corpse of this young boy. And um, when nothing happened, then um, the <laughs> Elisha has to go and... Uh, and pray personally, and then it happens. Another remarkable miracle. 2 Kings 5, verses 1 to 27. Here we have, again, another passage with Elisha, 
also involving his servant Gehazi, and it's Naaman, the Syrian commander, who has leprosy, and he hears that there is a, a God who heals in Israel and com- comes to the king of Israel saying, please heal me. And the king of Israel says, what's it come to me for? Uh, I can't heal the sick. This man's come to pick a fight. And uh, then the servant girl says, what about Elisha? It's interesting that the king didn't think of Elisha. And uh, there must have been here, that tells a huge story of some backslidden state of the nation. And uh, you know what happens? The Syrian commander comes to uh, ask Elisha to heal him and comes loaded with gifts and with this great pomp and ceremony and um, Elisha doesn't even speak to him. Sends his servant out. Here is a true prophet of the Lord who doesn't curry favor. He doesn't kowtow to anybody. And he does exactly what the Lord says. If the Lord had told him to go and speak to him, he would have done. But the Lord said, send your servant and tell him to dip himself seven times in the River Jordan. Why that filthy Jordan River? Why should I do that? Are there not better rivers in, um, in Syria? And of course, the man's offended. He said, I thought at least he would have come and just wave his hands over me in some kind of way and heal me. And this goes to show us there are no techniques, no preconceived ideas in the healing ministry. And then they spoke a bit of sense into this Syrian army officer and said, look, if he'd told you to do something very difficult, you would have done it. What have you got to lose? You came here a leper, you're going to go back a leper unless this, what have you got to lose? Go and do what he says. And of course, he dipped himself in the River Jordan seven times, and the seventh time he came up again, and he was totally healed. Now, of course, after this healing, this Syrian officer understood that uh, Yahweh, the Lord alone, is truly God. And he acknowledged this. This was an evangelistic healing. In fact, about half of the healings in the Old Testament are, you can see to be evangelistic. About half of them you can see to be um, perhaps within the community of those who knew God. Now, as a result of this, he said, okay, Elisha, I'm going to reward you well. I'm going to pay you. Here's a gift for what you've done. Elisha refused. He knew that no one could take human credit for something that God did. Nobody should be rewarded for what God alone can do. And uh, instead of thanking man, Naaman should be praising God. But he rode, rode off healed, blessed, and we have the, here the first example of a convert through the healing ministry. Now it's interesting that in Luke 4 verse 27, Jesus uses this story as a kind of proof text for his own healing ministry. It's the basis of his own healing ministry. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So this goes to show us how important it is to understand the Old Testament healing ministry if we're really going to understand Jesus' ministry as well. Now, 2 Kings chapter 13. Here we have another story, and let me read it to you. Verses 20 to 21. Then Elisha died and they buried him and the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the, sp- in the spring of the year. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elijah, Elisha and when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. There appears to be no faith in this story, only fear, only panic. And, uh, you know, we, it just goes to show us that you can't tame God. God is unpredictable. And you can't put him into some kind of mold of ministry. And uh, this is certainly an unusual healing, a sovereign intervention. He healed through the bones of the prophet. There was enough anointing left in them bones, my friend. Let's pray that we have, as, have something even like that anointing even when we're alive. 
Okay, 2 Kings 20, verses 1 to 11. Here we have the healing of the king Hezekiah. And uh, we know he pleaded with God. He was told by the prophet Isaiah that he, had, uh, he was going to die, put your house in order. But he pleaded, and God said, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. And was told to put a, 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 boy, a, a poultice of figs upon his, his boil, and he was healed. And God also gave a sign to demonstrate that as a reality. Okay, here are the nine healing examples. Let me share with you now, in closing, some of the principles we have learned. First of all, we have learned that the healing ministry in the Old Testament is exclusively the work of God's servants, the prophets, whom he anointed. Secondly, we notice that people sickness, uh, where people were healed, rather, from sicknesses that were occasionally due to personal sin. In some cases, number three, the minister or the sick person needed to do something in order to be healed. And number four, the prophetic minister either interceded with God for the healing or he announced the healing, and which could be as far away as a year later. Number five, the prophets did not go about offering healing indiscriminately, but they responded to requests given to them and responded to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We also know that not everybody, number six, who were ministered to were Jews. More than half were pagans outside of the covenant. Number seven, there was some element of faith and expectancy normally present. Number eight, many of the healings appeared to be instant, but there was sometimes a delayed appreciation. Number nine, many of the healings were signs directing to forgiveness, directing people's attention to forgiveness. And number ten, none of these principles applied sometimes. Sometimes God just did it. And as we bring the survey of the Old Testament healing to a close, that's a very healthy and salutary reminder. God cannot be put in a box. He is the sovereign God. He heals whom he chooses to heal, when, where, how, and we really have got to accept that. God is sovereign, but he is also the healer.